Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Wutia Koch, and I'm the director's representative for education and sales at Pauline Museum. And I am honored to open the International Congress, uh, the Jewish Cultural Heritage Perspectives, Practices, Challenges. Our main goal is to sum up what we have achieved as part of the project and look into the future, which in Poland looks much better this week much better than a week ago. Uh, so uh, the project that we're going to sum up uh, was possible thanks to great cooperation we have established over the last 10 years with uh, our Norwegian partners. Uh, and I will name those institutions in al alphabetical order. The European Vergeland Center, Falstad Center, Jewish Museum Oslo, Jewish Museum Trondheim, and the HL Center at the Holocaust um, Center in, in Oslo also. And also a wonderful Polish project partner, um, the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our partners for uh, you know, more than 10 years of great cooperation. And um, this event is an opportunity to celebrate the success of the project and to sum up and to think into the future. But now, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Hilda Kramer is the Professor of Illustration at the Faculty of Fine Art, Music and Design at the University of Bergen. Her field of research concerns new approaches to illustration and the communication chain and how design, visual communication and illustration together may constitute rich narratives. Her artistic research project concerns how in a time of hate rhetorics, the need to maintain a humanistic dialogue is of utmost importance. The title of Professor Scrammer's lecture is Illuminating the Not Representable. Thank you, for Professor, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. I have taught illustration at the University of Bergen uh, for more than a decade. And before that, I've been an illustrator for 30 years. And I will come back to why illustration matters in a context like this. But I think that historic events during the last week needs to be mentioned. Um, citizens of the world now hold our breath for the further development of the crisis in the Middle East, where people on both sides have suffered awful trauma of the conflict. Every bystander to a conflict need to consider the words we bring forward to not inflict more pain. The situation could be called wicked problems, which is a term from the design field. It harbors the meaning of questions that humans ask themselves that are seemingly impossible to solve. These are, for example, the climate change, and the overpopulation, wars, uh, ethnic conflicts, uh, which are like a knot that is so tied together and we are not able to solve them. The question is, if we stop dealing with these wicked problems, what happens then? I started engaging in these questions uh, regarding images and representation of human suffering um, almost a decade back. And some moments stand out in my memory. I was not present when the toddler Alan Kurdi drowned and was washed up on the beach of Bodrum in Turkey on the 2nd of September 2015. He and his family had fled the war, um, engulfing their country, hoping to 
join relatives in the safety of Canada. His mother and sister died in that same tragic event. Neither was I present six days later when a group of refugees uh, were uh, attacked uh, on the Hungarian-Serbian border as they tried to cross the border fences. A Hungarian Hun Cumbra woman was filmed sticking out her foot, apparently as a deliberate action, causing the man who held a child to fall over on top of the child. These are unfortunately not isolated incidents. Since 2016, war has again appeared on European soil. There are tensions in Kosovo, Nagorno-Karabakh, in Sudan, and the list goes on. I think there are many like me who feel a need, an urge to do something, to, to be part of a change. And in 2016, I have been part of a cooperation that is in close um, cooperation with the Pauline Museum and the Falsta Center. And we will hear more about this in the workshop section on Friday, Memory Dialogues on Anti-Semitism and Racism. It will be disseminated by Imgard Sundorf uh, from Leibniz Center of Contempor Contemporary History uh, of Potsdam and Katrin Lemme from Hamburg Media School on behalf of the institutions that have been part of this project. And it focuses on illustration, uh, sorry, it focuses on, on, on how we can work together to, to, uh, to meet these uh, problems. But I also, uh, on the side of this, have had this uh, project uh, that, that is my own and that focuses on illustration in particular. Deeply embedded in the question about racism and anti-Semitism is how we look at the other. This became the focus of my illustration research project um, called Illuminating the Non-Representable. It has two main agendas. Firstly, it asks how illustration in an expanded uh, approach may communicate profound human issues, issues considered unrepresentable or non-representable. Secondly, it treats the representation of the other. From the very beginning, uh, illustrators have been my implied audience to whom I address my research. My argumentation for that is faceted. First and foremost, every field needs to continuously discuss its own development. Secondly, <coughs> um, or, uh, seemingly, seemingly unsolvable research questions have often been crucial to redefine the existing theory and resulted in new ways of designing the field uh, and the understanding of the world. Illustration often operates as uh, ephemeral mediation formats destined to disappear, self-destruct, deteriorate or decompose. It is often seen in context of the most mundane aspects of human life, far away from questions concerning ethics, um, as, uh, philosophy and artistic ideals. I repeat the question posed in the prologue. Can illustration mediate complex matters such as the Holocaust? And would it matter how we do it? In 2020, 
the artistic research project illuminating the non-representable received external funding from the Norwegian artistic research program to explore how illustration may contribute to uh, specific history didactic educational settings also to contribute to collective memory through site-specific illustration-led projects. Artistic research takes place through the discipline and operates across fields of knowledge where a fertilization with other um, fields happen. There are four work packages. Three of these um, work packages are related to cultural memory of war, World War II history and the Holocaust. The first, on the upper left, treats the cooperation with the Falstaff Center. This is a human being, is run by the leader of education at Falstaff, Sebastian Klein, and you will hear more about this project during the workshop section on Friday. The second project has aspects of artistic explorations of the limits of what one might call a book, of illustration, definitions uh, and the performative potential of books. It is led by artist Imimov. The third project relates to sound as media format, asking if sound can be illustration. It treats the history of uh, Mumarken um, horse racing ground in the southeast of Norway that narrowly escaped becoming a concentration camp in 1944-45 through different sound formats Frederik Rishedal and Tani Andino have illustrated various topics of this history and finally there is a PhD project led by Tilde Dalager what all these projects have in common is the discussion of the unrepresented the underrepresented and the non-representable the overarching topic is intersubjectivity and how we humans tell stories of how we see each other and ourselves. We have had three main symposia with exhibitions, sound installations and performances uh, <coughs> uh, with uh, uh, part uh, participants from different fields of knowledge. Uh, there have been presentations from India to Turkey, from UK to Russia, USA and Europe. And the first symposium aimed to open a dialogue between different fields of knowledge. And therefore it was called Transposition as Artistic Practice. The second symposium took place at, um, uh, in Bergen and uh, treated the potential of materiality, space and embodiment f in pro projects focusing on complex matters. The third symposium took place at Falsta this summer with a presentation of the four work packages in its final stage. The project is now being disseminated in different formats and will be finished in 2024. However, there were topics that we had put aside mostly because of the challenges of ethical representation. The hunger in the Wuch ghetto and how it targeted the smallest children was something that we wanted to work with but it felt too difficult. Before we go further, I would like to address the use of the word Holocaust that dates from the 
early years after the Second World War, and the emerging term Shoah, that since the 80s has become in common use. As I do not want to erase history, I use uh, the old term in the early stage of the project, but have come to gradually use the word Shoah. In this text, you will find both of them. I also address another audience with this text, and that's the uh, members of this conference, Jewish Cultural Heritage, together with my own community illustration. In September 2024, the finished works will be exhibited in Oslo in the gallery Grafil, which is run by the organization of graphic designers and illustrators in Norway. An illustrator working with the Showa representation must reflect on the moral uh, uh, responsibility of generating and presenting a version of historic events to the world. What I see as a justifying argument for attempting to represent matters so long after the actual event, it is the possibility of the illustrator or any creative artist uh, in that situation to give the audience a glimpse into the past, in this case a horrible past, to make them reflect on the ethical questions they normally would shy away from. To obtain such a representational level, the illustrator may employ vessels that constitute bridges between the historic events and the audience. This is where my presentation touches upon the works of Walter Benjamin and the concept of aura in his classic essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. His text refers to the authority held by the unique artwork, the original artwork that has not been reproduced. Walter Benjamin was of course not thinking about mundane rationing cards um, for food, in, uh, when, when he wrote about uh, uh, aura and the art in the age of mechanical reproduction. I will come back to why this matters later. He wrote this in a time when his own life was under threat by the Nazi regime and he wrote about the relationship about the capitalist economy and the value of art. In earlier times, an artwork would hang in the studio of the art, uh, artist or be exhibited in a gallery to be sold to a collector or someone who might um, give it limited access to an exclusive audience. Mechanical printing technology was more efficient compared to the previous uh, manual presses when he wrote this essay. Um, it meant that artworks could be printed in thousands of copies to be distributed widely. But a reproduced artwork is never fully present according to Benjamin. Authenticity is everything um, uh, um, sorry, authenticity is not something that can be reproduced and it vanishes when everything is reproducible. Along with the loss of a phenomenon's authenticity, the authority is also gone. The loss of aura is also the result of the audience wish to constantly bring a phenomenon closer, a simulacrum 
destroys the unique uh, uniqueness of the artwork. Let me pause here for a moment and look at some examples of illustration that have been made directly related to the Shoah and to World War II. As much as I agree to much of what Benjamin says about aura, I also think that the reproduced imagery has a very powerful function in our time, such as uh, Mouse, the graphic novel by Art Spiegelman, which is considered a cornerstone within the graphic novel genre. And it both renewed the genre and it contributed widely to the Holocaust discourse. Mouse has shown a particular ability to stay relevant in the uh, societal discourse. And this is an indication, an inspiration to continue working with such, such questions through illustration. And in re recent years, we see a stream of relevant graphic novels adding to the discourse. Nora Krug's e exploration of her own German family history uh, is a recent attempt with her graphic novel Belonging in English or Heimat in German. And I think this is an excellent example of innovating use of colors and narratives related to such a topic. Recently, several illustrators have used the graphic novel to explore their family history in context to the Shoah. Serena Katz's um, exploration of her grandfather's recollections of being a Hitler Jugend in Germany with a Polish background uh, tells a story in several layers where the grandfather recalls his uh, glorious days of uh, a sunny childhood. Serena Katz's drawings and the textual narrations brings out different readings of this past. Swedish Joanna Rubin Dranger chooses the um, narrative angle from her Jewish ancestry background and how conscious or unconscious use of language covers the universal feeling of guilt and what could have been done to save more victims in the early stage of the war. Lila Korman traces her own family history in Poland and the events that took place during the Second World War. To conclude this part, there is a thriving illustration environment using auto-ethnographic approaches to the topic. What other illustration-linked projects brings up the topic. It could be timely to mention the context to, to the uh, etymological meaning of the word illustration and how it's been understood today. The illuminating project started with the symposium Transposition as Artistic Practice in October 2020 when the illustration theoretician Jalen Grove uh, followed the etymological trails of the two related words illustration and illumination. At their roots, the, uh, the proto-Indo-European look, um, light, brightness, uh, she writes, in, in Greek, there is leukos, meaning clear, bright, shining, white. In Latin, both illustrare and illuminare means to throw into light, to make bright, to light up. And it's interesting to note, writes Grove, that uh, a phonetically and semiotically close cousin um, the Proto-Indo-European root gel, which means to shine, to call or beckon, it is also related to the color yellow. 
It is at the base of the following words in Proto-Germanic. Gladas, meaning being radiant with joy. The old English word galdor signifies to spell, to charm, magic, enchantment. Furthering, uh, further following the, um, the linguistic trails, one finds gold, glimmer, glare, yellow, and yell. And these two aspects um, are uh, the two um, sides of illustration, as I see it, of positive potential and of danger. The digital turn provides the field uh, with new mediation platforms. Um, It was necessary to bring forward a definition of illustration that also takes into uh, consideration this change. In 2018, the book History of Illustration was published. For the first time, the field was seen from perspectives around the globe, not from the Western sphere. Uh, it is from this book I have taken the definition of illustration that we operate with in this project. And as you can see, it means that we are no longer um, limiting illustration to paper-based mediums. I mean, this is obvious. Since the digital revolution, illustration is found in, in apps, on phones, uh, it's part of the game development, it's, it's everywhere, on, on every digital platform as well as the printed ones. But it still is illustration. And what remains is an obligation to be aware of the content of the message who is the sender of the message and and uh, what it what it means so and, and as you see uh, illustration uh, consists of many elements it's the image elements but it's also often either embedded text or uh, connoted to text and then you have the overall design of things, which also brings in meaning. You have the materiality or the lack of uh, this in, in digital format. And you have narratology, storytelling. So all this together constitutes a, a message which is communicated and it's coded to be uh, read by uh, a receiver. So you see, here we have um, the communication chain, um, which uh, which is um, uh, defining the, the the communication chain of sender, medium, and uh, uh, um, and what matches which is being conveyed, and then there may be. Uh, disruption in this communication chain. It's uh, actually, um, uh, it, it origins from um, the telegraph invention. You can see the, the, the parts of, of what needs uh, to be there in order to send the message through the telegram system. But it still functions in contemporary media connections. Um, the noise or the disruption is something we see uh, operating very often in the uh, present media image that, that uh, we find often sophisticated methods where the message is uh, disrupted uh, somehow. Um, so the question is, what is the effect that remains uh, um, uh, what reaches the the um, the the, um, the end point, the receiver of the message, and uh, if there is a feedback to the sender. Uh, 
I want to, um, to, to take a look at if we just Google um, the question of uh, books and the Holocaust. Uh, what you see here is, uh, is a sort of random search and we get an image of, uh, of how, uh, in traditional uh, media forms, illustration and graphic design uh, represent this topic. Um, what are the common elements used? It's often the, the David Star, it's, uh, it could be barbed wire, it's trail tracks, uh, disappearing into fog and uh, what we may be in danger of if we do not break this kind of iconicity is that we don't reach young people of today because if they've seen it again and again and again they become immune to this kind of imagery. When um, humans experience trauma, the response is often split between a symbolic and anti-symbolic reading of the tra traumatic events. As Dewey writes, semantic meaning is created through languages. And Stuart Hall states that languages are systems of representation such representational systems can be applied to consolidate belonging and be distinguish those we want to distance ourselves from, the ones we regard as others. And illustration is a visual language. In visual language, sorry, uh, Images give the possibility of wordless communication, spoken across, uh, uh, across a spoken language. The visual language has a grammar, not identical to writerly text, but still it has a system that can be decoded by the viewer. In narrative images, compositions carrying vectors such as the gaze of the person, the eyes looking at the reader or out of the image is creating direction. Other vectors may be, for instance, arms or tools held that creates a direction and movement of the image. So this action works in many ways uh, the same way as verbs work in a written sentence. So these are narrative images, but there are another group of images that are called um, conceptual representations. They represent their participants in a generalized essence with a timeless appearance. As you see, there are no vectors in this image, so our, um, uh, our view is directed to the object itself, but it, has, it carries connotations, so our imagination is carried uh, uh, to, to, to other uh, parts of uh, history. Um, so, to talk about visual representations in the service of memory culture, every Holocaust museum has a book stand or a place where you can buy uh, different artifacts and books or, or publications related to what the museum contains. As I mentioned when I talked about the general uh, picture of uh, uh, book covers, if we do not break out of a certain convention of representing the past, we may lose the audience. 
In the next section, there are some examples to find new uh, angles using technology such as VR and AR. This is um, uh, from Instagram, Eva Stories. Let me see if I can, no, it seems like I'm not able to go into the to internet page, but um, you can find on Instagram this uh, profile uh, uh, which is um, made by uh, Maya and Mati Kohavi and they had the ambition of making the Shoah accessible to the generation who live their lives in social media. It's based on the diary of Eva Heyman from Hungary. Instagram was chosen as publication platform Eva Stories is a narrative constructed using a salient visual language with posted images and videos, stories and reels, hashtags and emojis, making it appear that the young girl in the app um, appears during the genocide on Instagram. A young actress appears as uh, Eva in costumes uh, on background backdrops that give connotations to wartime events and show the great gradual takeover by fascists and racist mindsets. Uh, the outreach of this uh, platform or of this project, um, if we measure success as uh, in, in terms of numbers, it has reached 1.1 1, uh, 1 million followers and should score quite high on such a scale. Another project um, is uh, here where um, one has used uh, uh, AI to create a series of images that are um, meeting the um, requests of a survivor. A Judith Braha Ser uh, Chok, who narrowly escaped death as um, Nazi allied forces stormed Odessa in 1941. The family planned to flee on a steamboat. Uh, but they had to return to land because Judith had lost her sandal back on land. Moments later, the ship was bombarded and almost all the passengers lost their lives. Judith and her family were relieved to have survived nat naturally. So what we see in this image is a visual artist who tries to visualize the memories of Judith by using AI. To illustrate the dra dramatic events, different versions were created. In every image, Judith is shown in the foreground as a small girl running away from the shipwreck. She uh, the, um, the survivor verbally expressed relief to have escaped the bombing and sorrow over the tragedy that had struck the, uh, those who remained on board. And she wanted both those feelings to be present in the face of the girl in the image. By small modifications, the visual artist could change different details in the image rendering, the elements in the backgrounds, the clothes she was wearing, and uh, last but not least, uh, the facial expression. Virtual reality uh, used in the Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, historical VR reconstruction project enables the uh, viewer to walk in the terrain of Oświęcim in Poland to see the wartime concentration camp of Auschwitz unfold before their eyes. Um, there is a coherent combination of various historical sources, images, testimonies, documents, and architectural plans. It is possible to see this both using VR glasses, but you can also uh, see it uh, on your computer screen, and the two different, uh, it will be two different experiences, as the uh, uh, screen will not be able to um, 
to to uh, to give this feeling of being surrounded by by the um, architecture or the infrastructure of the concentration camp. Um, and then we come to the Forever project at the British National Holocaust Centre. Um, there are other museums also using this technology where you have multiple cameras filming a person producing a 360 degree rendering of the recorded person or object. In this case, a survivor of the uh, Shoah. Through pre-recorded sessions, a vast number of questions, around 2,000 questions, were asked to the survivor and filming the reply. And then by applying AI technology, a visitor to, to this exhibition can ask a question to uh, the survivor via the screen and it will appear that the survivor is replying directly to, back to the viewer. Due to uh, technological um, issues, the, there is still uh, some some um, questions to be uh, to be asked uh, uh, around these uh, representations. As I said uh, previously, working with representations of the past needs to be done with awareness of how our efforts are received and interpreted. What are the consequences if we blur present and past? Uh, just a simple question of uh, young people. How, how are informed are they concerning the use of the Instagram, for instance? It, it, is, uh, it is not unthinkable that they will not understand that this is actually a fiction. So, the above-mentioned examples represent media technologies that create and transmit memory, shaping the society's recollection of how the past is understood, remembered and received. In the case of Eva stories, the project was met with mixed reactions, while many have applauded it for using a publication channel uh, used by a wide audience. Some have asked if the resources should not be channeled to a project that leave a bigger societal impact. Social media present news and editorial content in between domestic hacks and cosmetic advert uh, advertisements. The storytelling and the visual language of Eva stories resemble the commercial and entertaining content that surrounds it and may appear to simplify and trivialize the genocide since the rhetoric resembles mundane and banal phenomena surrounding it. Can any visual simulation such as VR ever recreate or bring the experience of devastating horror, pain, sickness, torture suffered by the inmates of a concentration camp? A colorful visual screen with dramatic music and sound effect cannot harbor the shock of gas being let into the shower after the doors closing, nor the nausea as the smoke from the crematoriums whirl around the area of the pr concentration camp prisoners. No one can ever imitate the collective feeling of exhaustion and fear. Despite what our eyes tell us, our brains are fully conscious about being safe in another time, in a different reality. The Forever Project uses technology that has an immediate impact on the viewer experiencing it for the first time. The survivors involved are enthusiastic about 
preserving their memory in such a spectacular way, while others voice their skepticism. The experience of getting um, replaced from an avatar-like human being presented on safe distance through a screen can never replace the experience of meeting a living survivor. Aspects of the technique, technical setup also gives a feeling of uncanniness rather than evoking the viewer's empathy. While I believe it would be a mistake to generally exclude digital technology from further explorations of mediation of the Shoah, we should observe a different direction in ongoing discourse and practice, the affective turn. The affective turn in culture memory practice involves touching, seeing, hearing, being with and talking about objects. Such approaches avoid the dichotomy between the artificial and the physical reality or blurring the past and present. Using sense-oriented technology uh, and learning um, strategies, the individual participants um, become involved in critical thinking in a way which I do not believe that the uh, technology uh, of, of um, VR and AR uh, can give us at this time. Coming to the project that I run, the common denominator behind the illuminating the non-representable project is this, to find what resources it takes to engage and learn about the past in a way that also creates awareness of the present and future challenges. I suggest that the aura of the Shoah narration does not only lie in the objects and artifacts, but in a meaningful transaction between the mediator of the history and the audience. On the screen, you see copies of the artist book, One of Many Lives Cut Short. It is a commemoration of the victims of Litzmannstadt Ghetto, the children during Vielka Spera. Each of these books are unique. They contain names of a child under the age of 10 who died in Helmno Nadnerem. We went through the um, inhabitants lists of, um, of um, Litzmannstadt ghetto, finding names of children and uh, sorting by date of birth and the day of deportation, we could have a relatively secure uh, uh, formation of that these were actually victims of the Spera and uh, the children between zero and ten uh, years. Um, and in the project that I'm about to show you now, uh, there are similar ideas behind uh, microhistory uh, and the understanding of the world from a fragment and the potential that lies in using uh, documents that originate from the ghetto. Um, hunger used strategically in war was a major part of the Nazi German strategy. Sadly, also today we see hunger used as a weapon in conflicts happening around us with potential effect to all corners of the world. This has inspired me to go back to the unused material from the ghetto. I have in my possession 10 uh, milk rationing cards from the ghetto. 
these ten brittle pieces of paper. I lack words to say what feelings it is to hold these pieces of papers in my hand, papers that could mean life or death 80 years ago to a small child. We could track these children from the uh, inhabitant list uh, in the archives. Parents' names, professions, uh, we found the names of the surrounding infrastructure uh, of the ghetto, which also gave ways of putting things in context. But how the combination of all this information could be translated into a, a suitable visual language was unsolved. Sometimes one has to begin with intuition, to let the subconscious flow take over in the search of ways to express. With Benjamin's text in mind, I began to look for a visual language that could express the history of these ten documents. Hunger was, of course, a major part of the suffering of all ghetto inhabitants, but the children stand out in particular. In the photos of the ghetto, the children queuing up to get a mouthful of the food handed out, disregarding of its look and nutrition value. These cards were given to secure fo uh, food for newborn and small children in the ghetto. It, and uh, uh, as I said, it is this unique, remarkable feeling to observe these documents at a close range and to use them as a source to collect data uh, about the children. How can starvation be uh, represented in an understandable visual language? Visible in the ghetto papers, for, uh, sorry, uh, photos, are often tools for eating. The spoons, forks, pots, pans. I came to think of the enamel cups in the hands of the children. Since I have such cups myself, I began drawing these as a starting point, much like a pianist would uh, let the fingers run over the piano to warm the fingers. So, as you saw in the previous uh, video, I used a huge graphite stick on a rough paper surface. And while drawing, I contemplated the ghetto life uh, when food was scarce. I imagined the parents rummaging the ghetto streets to buy milk. Um, I also imagined the grief of the parents when a child died of hunger. My drawings developed into an 11 meter long scroll and for some time I even considered this drawing to be exhibited in, uh, in an uh, exhibition. But I was never quite satisfied with this drawing. Somehow it lacked impact. I, it did not contain sufficient aura. So I returned to ideation stage. And uh, what you have seen now is uh, the production of monotypes, which is a graphic technique where you use uh, a stencil, but every copy becomes different. Um, you get your fingers dirty. Uh, there is a smell of paint while you work. And it is... Um, something that I think is easy to translate to an educational setting, much as we have done with Falsta, with different techniques of uh, representation, using drawing, and uh, using frottage, and so on. So, at this stage, the project is, is uh, not quite uh, finished, but um, but uh, but I, I continue to work developing uh, this concept to how can I transfer it from me as, as an illustrator to a young audience that might use it in an educational setting. 
so how does this differ from learning about history um, than if you use screen-based projects. First and foremost, it brings a direction within museum practice, uh, which is also about the, uh, about the affective turn. Um, and um, such approaches avoid the dichotomy between the, the artificial and the physical reality. Um, despite the motto of never again after the Second World War, genocides have happened in different corners of the world with history as a backdrop. Sadly, it is not unthinkable it can happen again. As I finish this presentation, an invasion war is going on in Ukraine. A bloody conflict takes place in the Middle East. Ethnic conflicts in Sudan raises genocide alarm uh, as war rages on. If one could bring out a deeper understanding on an individual level of young people today of the pain caused in such conflicts, one might avoid the devastating result we saw during World War II and in ongoing conflicts. What history can provide and what discussing representation of the Shoah can tr contribute to it is giving us a chance to consider how we want to respond to such draconian challenges. The question of illustration and dissemination of the Shoah is far from concluded. Thank you. <laughs>